Copper is actually on pace now for its worst day in more than a month, but year to date, it's still up 25 percent. Silver's up 35, uh, 30 percent, gold up 25 percent, and gold has closed at a record 23 times so far this year. My next guest is turning to precious metals as one area where you can still find value. Joining me now is Matt McLennan. He's co-head of Global Value Team and Portfolio Manager at First Eagle Investments. Uh, Matthew, it's great to check in with you again. Welcome. Great to see you, Kelly. What do you make of the fact that all of these commodities, we have the precious metals, but also the kind of cyclical metals, uh, the in, in more industrially sensitive ones, all rising in tandem, albeit with copper sitting out today. But what do you think is going on here? Well, it's interesting. Not only are we seeing um, cyclical commodities like copper rising at the same time as potentially defensive uh, commodities like gold, we're seeing risk assets doing well. Uh, look at what the S&P has done in terms of its multiple. Uh, look at where credit spreads are relative to where they were six or seven months ago. At the same time, the gold is making new highs. And so we're really seeing conflicting signals here uh, between assets that you think are risk on and assets that are defensive. And I think uh, one of the reasons for this may be that uh, what we're seeing here is not um, the usual uh, turn in the cycle. Uh, what we might be seeing is the cumulative effect of the step function uh, of the growth in government debt and what I would refer to as the nominal rebasing of the economy. The price of everything is up. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and that's the, the key issue here. So let me dive into that for a second because a lot of people are trying to figure this one out. I mean, is, is what you're saying is that the fact that all commodities are rising in price just the fact that the dollar is being debased because of the high deficits we're running? That's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, as you issue new government debt, and there's been a lot of uh, government debt issuance uh, since 2019, all that is is a promise uh, to create more money in the future, unless there's a credible plan to pay that debt off over time. And I, I don't see one of those plans on the horizon right now. So I think the cumulative effect of these large deficits the cumulative effect of the growth in the stock of government debt has to, been to rise the, raise the nominal high watermark of the economy to, to increase prices across risk assets and across potential hedge assets. I'm glad that you put your finger on that because I do think it explains some of what's going on with the consumer where, you know, high prices are mean, you know, there's a level of higher spending, but no one feels that great about it or feels like it's going that far. Look at real estate and, and prices there. And people will often say, well, but look at the dollar. You know, the dollar's strong relative to other currencies. But the other currencies themselves are only being compared with other currencies. So it, we kind of have to look to real assets to give us some sense of what actual value is. Yes, things that we can't print, basically. And, and I think that's the, the key. And uh, I, I think one of the things that's been confusing investors here is that um, there's a sense that we're coming out of this uh, slowdown and that we have uh, potentially years of growth ahead of us. Now, you know, strange things can happen in the economy. That's possible. But I would just make the simple observation, Kelly, that uh, you know we're coming off very low levels of unemployment, and the unemployment rate is starting to drift higher. We're not doing what you'd usually expect coming out of a recession. We're not coming off high levels of unemployment with the unemployment rate drifting lower. So uh, you know we look more like a, a sort of a slow stall zone uh, closer to the peak of the cycle. And so I think um, in, investors need to not be complacent in, in this backdrop. Would you go so far as to say that you could, for instance, buy copper here even into an economic slowdown? And I want to just mention there are some smart traders on the buy side who would say that's exactly what we're going to do. Look, I'm not so smart to know exactly how these things are going to play out. If you, if you thought there were going to be a, um, an economic slowdown, I think you'd, you'd opt for a, a potential a hedge such as gold or, or um, long dated treasuries or something of that nature. But um, and, and in fact, it's interesting to note that not only have precious metals uh, broken out on the upside here, uh, but uh, we still have an inverted yield curve. And so those are those are cautionary signals. I think the people who are interested in copper um, that I speak to are, are sort of key mining executives who are very focused on the more secular demand trends for copper, given the electrification um, of the grid. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's a more secular argument as opposed to a short term cyclical argument. Oh, sure.